tilt the banknote. The emerald number in the bottom left corner displays an effect of the light that moves up and down. The number also changes color from emerald green to deep blue. Welcome to the first in a series of lectures on the physiology of the endocrine system. These lectures are meant to be at the level of an undergraduate course in human anatomy and physiology. Let's begin with an important definition. Homeostasis is the maintenance of constant conditions in the internal environment. Note that word maintenance. A common mistake that students make is to define homeostasis as simply constant conditions in the internal environment. The body tries to maintain a normal temperature. If you're too cold and need to gain heat, you will shiver and muscular activity will warm you. Your blood pressure needs to be maintained as well. The heart and blood vessels as well as the kidney react to nervous and chemical signals to maintain blood pressure homeostasis. Blood glucose also needs to be maintained within normal levels. This illustration shows how blood glucose changes over time. Notice that when blood glucose is too high, the body sends a signal to lower it, and when the blood glucose is too low, a different signal is sent to raise it. So the glucose levels in the body are adjusted to maintain glucose homeostasis. Homeostasis requires communication. In order to maintain a normal balance, groups of cells in different places in the body need to send and receive information. Your body has billions of cells. In order for such a complex organism to function properly, communication is required. You've already seen how the nervous system acts to communicate from one part of the body to another. Now let's see how communication is maintained by chemical signals. In this series of lectures, we will be looking at the relationship between the hypothalamus and pituitary, we'll look at the thyroid gland, the adrenal cortex and medulla, the endocrine pancreas, and male and female reproductive endocrinology. Endocrine glands make chemical signals that are released into the bloodstream and are carried everywhere in the body. Only certain cells will respond. These cells have receptors for the hormone and are called target cells. You can think of these chemical signals, these hormones, as keys. The keys are made in the endocrine glands and are released into the bloodstream and go everywhere. Certain cells, target cells, have locks or receptors that these keys will fit into. When the key and lock combination come together, when the endocrine hormone and receptor come together, it changes the activity of the cell. For example, the hormone glucagon will fit into a receptor on the liver cell to signal the cell to release glucose. So hormones go everywhere. They act on target cells, cells that have receptors for the hormone. What might be the advantage of this kind of communication compared to the nervous system? The effect of hormones in the body are of course related to the amount of hormones secreted but can also be affected by the number of receptors. We'll have more to say about this in future lectures. So for example, if you don't have enough hormone, the body can increase the number of receptors. That's called upregulation. If you have too much hormone, the body can reduce the number of receptors and that's called downregulation. So what do these chemical signals, these hormones, look like? Well, they look like a lot of different things. And let's take a brief survey of the different kinds of molecules that can act as signals or hormone, because that's what we're talking about here, communication via chemical signals. Hormones can have the shape of peptides. They can be short chains of amino acids. Here we see thyroid releasing hormone, a very small molecule with only three amino acids. Here's parathyroid hormone, a protein, a longer chain of amino acids. Parathyroid hormone, 
hormone is critical in the management of calcium homeostasis. Hormones can be quite large in complex molecules. Here we see a glycoprotein. This is one part of thyroid stimulating hormone, or TSH. Follicle stimulating hormone, FSH, and luteinizing hormone, LH, have similar shapes. Hormones can have the shape of steroids. The steroid backbone can be modified in various ways to give us the steroid hormones. This is an example of estrogen. Hormones can look like amines. This hormone, epinephrine or adrenaline, is made in the adrenal medulla. So the point is that hormones can have a variety of different shapes. The messenger can have many forms, but they all work to carry a message to a cell. Cells with receptors for the hormone will respond. These are called target cells. Hormone is a messenger. In our next video, we'll look at how hormone release is regulated and we'll look at more details on the interaction of the hormone with cellular machinery. I'm an inquisitive person. I think I was born to be a scientist. I know right from an early age that I had that capacity to want to go and explore. My family background comes from a farming background. My parents were dairy farmers. Knowing that I came from a farm, I was very much interested in veterinary science. I had many teachers and instructors that were passionate about animals. 
And uh, whilst doing animal husbandry, I learned a lot from a number of those people. Here at Griffith University, I had the great opportunity to meet a number of significant mentors that changed my path uh, and my life forever. I think the most remarkable experience I've had in my entire career is to work with young people and seeing how they mature as the next generation of scientists. That enthusiasm and passion development uh, in, in their life, in their career, at the early stage where they actually get what science is all about. Griffith University is a multidisciplinary university that integrates aspects of sciences from all fields. And for me, that's a unique difference to this university compared to anywhere else in the world. We have the capacity to bring chemistry and biology and physics and computational science all together in one team to solve intractable problems. We have an amazing, talented team of researchers that I work with on a day-to-day -day basis. The work that we do clearly makes a difference towards helping humanity fight disastrous diseases, emerging diseases and existing diseases, both infectious disease and cancers. We have a number of other research groups within this institute that are doing exciting work that we can connect with and use the science that we know very well with the science that they use very well every day. The major breakthrough moment for me in my own research is now where we have established a drug discovery pipeline to treat and prevent croup in children. I'm excited by my future, my career particularly, uh, because I think I'm at a stage now where we are leading the world in certain areas of research. I'm Professor Mark Finichstein, Director of the Institute for Glycomics at Griffith University. Welcome to Silk. Silk is a powerful platform for storing, visualizing, and publishing data. Silk is the name of the platform, but we also refer to individual data sites as silks. A silk covers a single topic, for example, a visitor's guide to Paris or information about the San Diego Zoo. Now, you're probably familiar with spreadsheets. Spreadsheets are a pretty common way to store, display, and edit data. For example, here's a spreadsheet that lists different animals that are in the San Diego Zoo. In a spreadsheet, each row represents a single item. In this case, each line is an animal. When we import this spreadsheet into a silk, each row will become a data card. A data card is how we refer to a single record, that is, a single data object inside of silk. One animal, one data card. Four animals, four data cards. To keep things organized, data cards are grouped into collections. In a silk about Paris, there might be a collection of museum data cards. Or, in a company directory, there might be a collection of employee data cards. In our San Diego Zoo silk, we have a collection of animal data cards. You can, of course, have multiple collections in the same silk, as in this zookeeper collection. But, let's just focus on the one for now. Before you import your spreadsheet, you'll need to remember to include a single row at the top of the spreadsheet that provides a name for each of the columns. These become labels for the data card facts. Here, one label is for the biological class. This value for each data card can be unique or shared. It is the relationships between data card facts that are the building blocks of visualizations. As in this pie chart, which illustrates the distribution of biological class among the animal data cards. As a counterpoint to data cards, in a silk there are also pages. Pages are purely for presentation and behave just like any other page on the internet. You can use them to build and publish your data story, beautifying them with the visualizations you've created from your data card collections. 
These pages have unique URLs which you can share with colleagues and friends. It's also possible to share individual visualizations or embed them directly into your existing website. Well, I think that should be enough to get you started. Happy silking! How to find peer-reviewed education articles. So, you need to find peer-reviewed articles for an assignment. First, what is a peer-reviewed article? A peer-reviewed article is one that has been reviewed by scholars who are subject specialists in the same field as the author. The group of peer reviewers can accept an article for publication, request revisions before publication, or reject an article. Because of this process, peer-reviewed articles and journals are considered the most authoritative and reliable sources for academic research. Next, how do you find one? The best way to start is to navigate to the EMED Library Guide. The EMED Guide is linked in Blackboard from the Library tab. Once you've reached the welcome page of the guide, click Find Articles. Then choose Peer Reviewed Articles. Follow the instructions and start by selecting keywords for your topic, since you can't search with sentences or questions like you can in Google. For example, if your research question is, what is the effect of the flipped classroom on math skills? Your first keywords would be flipped classroom and math. Once you have your keywords, you're ready to use Search at CU Libraries, our catalog that looks for articles in many databases at once, or if you prefer, choose an individual education database. If you use Search at CU Libraries, it's important to sign in so you maximize the number of results you receive. After you sign in, enter your keywords and click Search. Then click on Peer-Reviewed Articles to filter out sources like newspapers and magazines that are not peer-reviewed. If you search an individual database, be sure to check a box that says Peer-Reviewed or Scholarly Journals. In some databases, you will only see the Peer-Reviewed filter option if you're using the Advanced Search feature. In a Gale database, choose Advanced Search, then look for the box that says Peer-Reviewed Journals. Some databases, like the SAGE database, don't include a box to check because all of the articles are peer-reviewed. You can also search Google Scholar for articles, but there's no peer-reviewed box to check and not all of the articles are peer-reviewed. You'll need to investigate each journal to find out if it's peer-reviewed. Finally, if your keywords aren't finding the articles you're looking for, you'll want to try additional keywords. The Search Tips page of the MED Library Guide provides search tips, examples of keyword brainstorming, and an advanced search example. And that's how to find peer-reviewed education articles. If you have questions, ask a librarian. We're here to help. Looking for students to help you with your research? Today, your friends at the UCLA Library and the Undergraduate Research Centers are here to help you easily find qualified undergraduate students for your research projects. The Undergraduate Research Portal, URP for short, is a new tool from the UCLA Undergraduate Research Centers that helps connect students to faculty with available research positions. You can use it to restaff your projects as students graduate or to fill new positions as they open up. This research does not have to be in a science or engineering lab. It can be any kind of information gathering or data analysis. Research projects in all disciplines are welcome, from the sciences to the humanities, arts, and social sciences. Get started by creating your posting for available research opportunities. You'll need a job description, desired qualifications, position type, start date, four credit options, and contact information for interested students. It's helpful to come up with a descriptive title that includes the discipline and project topic to catch the eye of browsing students. From here, you can either publish the posting or wait for interested students to contact you. Or you can browse the student profiles to find a candidate and reach out to them directly. You can sort students by major, graduation year, self-reported GPA, and type of position the student is seeking. You can select students by clicking the plus sign in the upper right hand corner of their profile card. The portal allows you to directly send your opportunity and a customized message to the students without ever having to leave the page. Looking for help with the next steps? Contact the Undergraduate Research Centers for portal assistance or email the help desk. Good luck with your research!
FSC stands for the International Master of Science in Fire Safety Engineering. And the international aspect is quite important. We have a very wide diversity of nationalities in students, but also in teaching staff and participating institutes. And so we have Ghent University, Lund University, the University of Edinburgh, and then we have partners ETH2, uh, University of Queensland and University of, of Maryland. So you can see the international aspect. The main purpose of high safety engineering is actually to protect the human life and protect property. That's what fire safety engineering is all about. Assist firefighters as well. <laughs> oh yeah, assist firefighters as well, definitely. <laughs> I think fire safety engineer is like an engineer of everything because it's not only about chemical engineering or electrical engineering or civil engineering because we have to know a little bit of everything and to solve the fire safety problems. Engineering is just the way to uh, get some results. But on the basis, it's uh, human life and responsibility. Well, IMFC was created with the idea of establishing a benchmark. So we set up the standards that effectively determine how high a person can, needs to go before they can actually call themselves a fire safety engineering, engineer. So what we have really is a program that uh, not only provides the highest level of education, but also blends the different points of view of different countries that enables us to really deliver to a student the capacity to operate worldwide at the most at the highest level of fire safety engineer. Um, I think like Edinburgh is more uh, based towards structural engineering mm -hmm. than Moon is more um, evacuation human factor. and human factors. Yeah. yeah. And then Ghent is like more the, uh, the general fire and safety than uh, engineering. Yeah. But apart from that, actually, the social life is the best part of MFSC. You gotta like, you know, have meet people from all over the world. You gotta travel a lot. You never feel like you know you've been traveled to so many countries and meet so many people, amazing people, and you definitely party a lot as well. <laughs> it's very special that you move in different to different universities and you get the best courses from the best universities. On the fire safety uh, in the fire safety field, mobility was a really interesting part. We were traveling around. We, uh, yeah, we saw new places. Um, it's also interesting because this program is uh, well, not something that um, there is nothing similar in Serbia. So it was really interesting to have some new knowledge about this area of engineering. I think changing location every semester is the best. Thing about well, the first semester was in Edinburgh, second was in Lund, third was in Ghent, and the fourth was in Maryland. So I visited the four universities, which is a great experience. There was time for everything: traveling, uh, studying, yeah. meeting up with friends, dinners. It was a mix of everything. Yeah. yeah it's always a tight, a tight schedule, so you have to make some time to study and then squeeze. We didn't sleep, so yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, the sacrifice from some things. It's either the grades or the sleep, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of unique experience that uh, we can make friends with a lot of people from different countries and try to work together because cultural difference or different perspectives. So sometimes it's difficult, but after we go through it, just can learn a lot from it. Uh, the students come from all over the world. Uh, so their market is also all over the world and it's part of the intention with the program to uh, bring students uh, from many places, implement and teach them knowledge, skills and uh, competences that then they can bring back to resp their respective countries. Many of them come from uh, countries where fire safety engineering uh, is very new and, and possibly non-existing in, in terms of the engineering aspect. They have codes and regulations, uh, but they will bring that back and, and then uh, foster further growth in the area all over the world. It's still developing. It's, it's, it's a really young uh, profession. So that means there are going to be a, really, uh, a lot of future opportunities in this area. Yeah, I think the career perspectives for the students are very positive and I think they can go different routes from both academic uh, such as PhD students but also coming into the consultancy world because they have this high level of, of uh, knowledge on fire safety engineering so I think they are very good. Uh,
a perspective for getting a job. To get a job is easy. It's really easy uh, after you get the LFC uh, certificate. Uh, the thing is, in uh, a lot of people I meet who are working in the fire industry right now, uh, they, they don't have a fire degree, they have a specific mechanical or electrical kind of uh, degrees, then learning the job while they're working. Yeah. But uh, so these senior engineers, when they learn about what we study, like specifically fire, uh, it's kind of imp impressive for them because um, you already know a lot before you start working. So I think this degree helps um, in terms of finding a, in, a new job or if you want to do PhD, definitely. It's um, really recommended for everyone who is uh, keen for a good position in his uh, future. You, you really learn everything in this program that you need for the professional life. Are you having trouble finding a class you need to complete your transfer, degree, or certificate requirements? Do they conflict with your schedule? Are required courses already full? Is it delaying your graduation or transfer? Don't panic. The course exchange is here to help. Now you have a new option. Find that course at one of the other California community colleges that participate in the new online course exchange. You can register for up to two online exchange courses each term if you are a California resident, have already completed your assessments, education plan, and orientation at your home college, and are currently enrolled in at least one course there. We've streamlined the registration process to make it easy for you. It's simple. Register for courses as usual in your home college's registration portal. Follow the links to find an additional exchange course you need. Register and enroll at the teaching college offering the course. Take the online course on the familiar system-wide course management system, Canvas. Ready to give it a try? Mm -hmm. Start with your home college's registration system. After you've confirmed registration for classes offered at your home college, the course exchange link will appear. If you still need a class, click on the link. Select the term you're registering for. You'll see a list of courses available to you with the following information. The equivalent course at your home college, the number of available seats remaining, the name of the course at the teaching college, the number of units, the course start and end dates, and the name of the teaching college offering the course. Your screen may look slightly different depending on your home college registration system and updates to the site. You can change the term using the Terms tab or go back to the Get Started page anytime by clicking the logo on the top left. Click on the More Details link to find the instructor's name if it's available, information on any prerequisites, and the course description. To choose a class, click the Add Section button. If you are not already enrolled at the teaching college, you will be directed to CCC Apply to review and update your pre-filled college admissions application. Approval could take a few hours or a few days. While your admissions application is being processed at the teaching college, you will see a button that displays In Progress View Status. Once you're accepted by the teaching college, the current status for the course will be updated. Then you'll be able to finish registering. You'll be directed to the teaching college to pay any necessary fees. If you are using financial aid, follow the required steps for processing financial aid, which is found under the My Notifications tab. Status notifications will be emailed to you. You should check the website status page for important information about your exchange courses, like sending transcripts to your home college, requesting accommodations if you are a disabled student, dropping or withdrawing from an exchange course, and combining units for maximum financial aid award. 
Click on the My Schedule tab to see a combined schedule of all your home college and course exchange classes. Watch for communication from both the teaching and home colleges, so you'll be prepared when the course begins. You have successfully registered through the course exchange. Congratulations. You are on your way to getting the classes you need to complete your college career. Find out how the California Community College Online Education Initiative is working to improve your student experience. Visit us at ccconeline.ed.org. Right now in Denmark, there are a thousand talents from all around the world gathered to take part in an experiment called the Unleash Lab. They are going to work towards solutions for the Sustainable Development Goal Challenges identified by the UN. And on Sunday, a lot of these talents are going to come to Aarhus University and are going to pitch their ideas and solutions at the Lakeside Auditorium. Uh, this is a free event, and I hope to see as many of you as possible uh, to come and listen to the ideas from these talents. Most folks, I would say, probably have no idea of the, uh, uh, the, 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 the vast uh, resources that the Commonwealth has protected. And Massachusetts has done such an amazing job of protecting its land uh, and its land that is accessible to the entire public. Just in DCR alone, we have over 450,000 acres of protected land. Governor Baker gets it, and the more I get him out here to see what we actually have, I think the more he gets it and the more he enjoys it. Uh, he always comes to our events uh, with a smile on and calls us the, uh, uh, you know, the Department of Fun. To be able to work for a man like Charlie Baker, I knew it would just be an exciting once in a lifetime opportunity and I, uh, I, I did not hesitate in, uh, in accepting that offer. So I think if we don't get kids outside to enjoy, to see the beauty of, of, of this space, they're never going to have the desire, the interest and the knowledge to know why we should preserve it for the next generation. Construction of my own home was uh, was one of the things I guess that stood out in my background, and it, it was the, um, what is called uh, a passive home, and it's uh, it's a very interesting, unique building standard, and it was the first one of its kind in Massachusetts. The, the fusion of energy and environment is uh, two things that you know I think I have a complete background in coming into this position. I was fortunate to uh, to be a member of the United States national rowing team and the lightweight men's double. Uh, I, uh, I rode competitively for about 10 years, and it was, uh, it was an experience of a lifetime. It, uh, it started, I think, with a passion of being out and being outside and being on the water. I'd like to think that you know, my uh, getting out there and uh, exposing the public to maybe some new, new activities or, uh, uh, gets people excited and opens up the opportunity. That's really one of the things I really hope to, uh, to be able to do in my time as secretary, is to be able to uh, show folks what's possible right here in Massachusetts. I hope to be able to you know, get out there firsthand, show people uh, what, what is available to the public, and uh, I encourage people to come out and join me. I'm Matt Beaton, and I'm the Secretary of Energy and Environmental Affairs. Hello, I'm Josh Schneider, EPAD Community Manager, and today I'll be introducing you to EPAD. EPAD is open source, downloadable software developed by Stanford University Libraries and Partners. It harnesses machine learning and natural language processing to help cultural heritage institutions automate the process of screening email archives for confidential information and preparing them for analysis by scholars. Using these same tools on the public-facing side, EPAD supports browsing, search, and visualization of email archives, extending the ability of scholars to analyze these materials. EPAD is Java-based software packaged for Mac and Windows that runs in Chrome and Firefox browsers. It consists of four modules that build on each other but can be run independently in different locations. The appraisal module provides donors, curators, and archivists with a toolset to review and manage an email archive prior to accessioning it to a repository. The processing module is designed for archivists to further perform all functions included in appraisal, as well as other tasks that prepare the archive for discovery by and delivery to end users, such as reconciling extracted entities with established authority records. The discovery module allows researchers to browse and search a redacted email archive online 
prior to physically traveling to a repository's reading room to access the full corpus. And the delivery module is designed to provide users with access to the full contents of the processed email archive, including attachments from a managed workstation in a repository's reading room. The initial release of EPAD was developed with funding from the National Historical Publications and Records Commission in collaboration with partners at Columbia, NYU, the Smithsonian Archives, and the Bodleian. We gathered feedback from donors, curators, archivists, and researchers at each of these institutions to develop functional requirements. Phase 2 development is sponsored by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. We are performing this work with partners at Metro, University of California, Irvine, Harvard University, and University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. The EPAD software can be downloaded from GitHub via a link on our project website. The website also includes links to documentation, a mailing list, and to community forums. Thank you for watching this EPAD overview. We hope you'll participate in our growing community. To contribute feedback or suggestions for EPAD development, visit our forums or submit our user story through our website. If you have any questions, you can contact us at epad underscore project at stanford.edu. Well, IPAS stands for Integrated Planning and Advising Services. And uh, what it essentially entails is a, a suite of different uh, software tools that harnesses or leverages uh, existing data that institutions might have, whether it comes from their SIS or their ERP or even their LMS. Being able to integrate a technology solution to help with student advising, student counseling, student intervention of issues and, and problems. It's a market acceleration grant funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I understand there's four areas that they're interested in developing. Progress tracking, um, student planning, um, uh, advising and counseling, as well as uh, early alert systems. The overall goal always for that technology solution was to be integrated into the institution's business practices with the ultimate goal of helping students succeed and make it all the way to completion at the institution. IPASS is such a nascent field that we don't really know that much about its effectiveness. Uh, we don't really know whether it works or not yet. And so I think it's imperative for institutions that are thinking about implementing these things to think very carefully about how they want to measure uh, the particular outcomes uh, that, that, that they're wanting to assess, but also to think about evaluating their processes as, as they go along and integrating these things. The technologies are another tool in the tool belt. Um, I am one of those people that will try anything because any one tool has a potential for reaching a group, a population that might otherwise not be reached. Um, part of the IPES grant has included some uh, change management training. Um, there is a certain disruption to the processes and business of colleges and universities uh, when they are implementing this and, and, and bringing it online. Um, I know of several instances where um, it uh, for example, in, in, in doing the uh, degree planning projects, the entire curriculum and course catalog would have to be loaded into this digital tool. And in the process of doing that, they would find all of these dead-end courses or uh, uh, things that had prerequisites when the prerequisites didn't exist anymore and, and so forth. And that led to this sort of sea change of an overhaul of the curriculum, a rethinking of, of departmental majors and so forth, and really a streamlining in many ways of, of the course offerings. So it, it ends up being a benefit on, on, on the back end, but it's something that really was not anticipated on the front end of, of, of doing this. And I think that caused a lot of consternation <laughs> and, 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 and uh, headache in the moment, but the institutions with whom I've spoken who have done that, I, I think have found that to be beneficial. And so just as you hear about change management, you know, find those informal leaders in the institution who can be those champions. That's what we did, is we sort of found these folks um, that, that were liking it, that were jumping in and using it, and then we got them to talk throughout the institution. Talk about your experience with this. Yeah, I've made some great friends through the IPASS crowd, and just to hear about what's going on, what other people are doing, has actually made me feel pretty good about what we're doing 
so it's given me a little bit of confidence and reinforcement there. Um, that said, I, I, I think there's a lot of promise here for institutions that are especially struggling with ways to reach out and to connect with their students and to really uh, provide them with um, the broadest degree of, of, of student support services that, that they can. Certainly it is, as all projects are, it's kind of a complicated process with lots of moving pieces. Get the buy-in up front from a, a broad committee and, and educate them as to why the change is necessary, what the change is going to do, what's needed from stakeholders. Once you sort of compartmentalize the technology integration piece, the other side of it is to just really think about those business practices at the institution and the ways that having this tool can positively impact those business processes. We're seeing that it's worth it. We are seeing good results in our data, good usage saturation across the college, and I think that that's only going to improve. So it's been very worthwhile for us. Using multi-search to get articles, books, and more. Brought to you by CSUSB's John M. Pfau Library. You can use what you learn in this video to find information resources in most of the library's databases. Multi-search is a gateway to the deep web as it searches nearly all of the library's databases and the library catalog. The first step is to think of keywords or main ideas that get at your topic or research question. If, for example, I am interested in how commercials and other advertisements affect teenagers' body image, I might use the keywords media, body image, and teenagers. You will see two tabs of results, articles and books and media. Let's look at articles. Since multi-search searches across many databases, you will likely get many results. To the right of your results, however, you can refine your search in a variety of ways. For example, you can limit what you see to scholarly peer-reviewed journals. Or you can refine by format, topic, publication year, and more. If you find something that you're interested in, go ahead and click on the title in blue. You will likely see bibliographic information, a summary or abstract of the article, and software-generated citations. Be aware that these citations might contain errors, so you'll want to check them using a style guide. Once you're ready to access an article, Select the Search for Full Text option in blue. This will let you know if we have it. If not, you will be presented with alternatives for getting the item. Let's go back to our initial results screen. If you are interested in books, select the Books and Media tab here. This works the same way. You can refine your results on the right. Click on a title to learn more about an item, including whether it's print or electronic. If it's a print book, be sure to note the location since you'll need to come to the library to check it out. The status will indicate if it's available. To access electronic books, you'll look for a full text available link. And that's multi-search. Remember that using keywords, refining your results, and double-checking software-generated citations are good practices that can be applied when using most of the library's databases. Hello everyone, and welcome to this EarthSci introductory video on 3D data. To begin with, we're going to look at some of the seismic data inside the Common Earth model. Seismic lines are an EarthSci-specific 3D format Instead of projecting a raster onto the surface of the globe, we extrude a curtain layer down from a line across the globe and project a raster image onto that line. 
Each of the individual seismic layers have a little eye next to them in the catalog view. If I make the information panel a little bigger, I can select any of these layers to show the information for that page. Each line sends us to a different web page, which allows us to read about that particular line and download the data. I'll select all the seismic data in the catalog and deselect all of the folders and click the green plus button at the top of the catalog view to add them all into the scene at the same time. Because this is quite a lot of data, it's going to take a minute to load it all in. Now that I've loaded in all of my seismic lines, I need to change the draw order. When I added it all in, it's added the catalog with its whole tree underneath the default layers. However, because all of this data is sitting underground, I need to move any data that's going to be sitting on the surface, such as the NASA blue marble layer that I am using. I'm going to grab it and move it down so that it sits beneath my seismic lines. Now that I've done that, I can fade out the blue marble layer and see the seismic lines beneath them. Scale back the vertical exaggeration. There are actually two kinds of data there. The first, the big white and gray curtains, are the curtain layers that I spoke of before. The second is the colored interp layers, which are the lines that are drawn on those seismic profiles. These lines aren't actually drawn on the surface of the layers. They are their own independent 3D models. If we fly over to the last seismic line in the list, these lines are separate GoCAD models showing scientists' interpretations of the seismic data. Because they're a separate GoCAD model, we can toggle them off and on. We can also load in 3D surface models. From the Common Earth model, I am going to load in the major crustal boundaries. This is a 3D surface model which covers all of Australia. It is a large data set built from seismic interpretations. And if we zoom in to where the model intersects with one of the seismic lines, we can actually see where exactly the interpretations of the seismic profiles intersect with the surface model. And if we toggle it off, we can actually see the exact line in the interpretation that corresponds to the surface. Now that I've got quite a lot of 3D data in the scene, it would be wise to delete bits that I don't need anymore. And so because the seismic data sets are quite large, I am going to delete them from the scene. It will depend on how powerful your machine is as to how much data EarthSight can handle. As long as you've got video card memory available, EarthSight will, however, load in as many models as you want and allow you to view them at the same time. And it doesn't matter if these are smaller models of localized areas or if they're incredibly large models like the crustal boundaries which span over an entire continent. To demonstrate this I've loaded in the Bowen Surratt Basin model. The Bowen Surratt model is a surface model depicting the geological surfaces in the Bowen Surratt Basin. Despite the fact that I've already got the crustal boundaries loaded, EarthSight will happily load in this localized model and allow me to look through the different surfaces down to the basement. The last large 3D feature in EarthSci is volume data sets. EarthSci supports loading in volume data sets, and an example from the Common Earth model is the OSREM data set. Now that I've loaded the data in, we can see a very large box that has been deformed to the shape of the globe. If I click and drag anywhere on the surface of this volume, EarthSci will slice through the volume, showing me the different layers of data from top to bottom. I can also click on any of the sides or even the bottom of the volume and drag the mouse to slice through that volume from any of the different sides of the box in order to see a smaller version of the data. Thanks for joining us for this video on 3D data in EarthSci. For more information, please visit ga.gov.au slash EarthSci. What is Ixia? Ixia is an index that expresses the level of socio-educational advantage of students in a school. Students' level of socio-educational advantage generally affect their levels of educational achievement. It also influences other outcomes. Ixia is calculated using information on parents' education and occupation. It also takes into account other data, such as the proportion of students who are indigenous and the extent of the school's geographic remoteness. The Commonwealth Government requires all schools to collect this information, and this information is then used by ACARA. 
Ixia has been set with a mean of 1000 and a standard deviation of 100. A school with an index of 1200 has students who, on average, are two standard deviations above the national mean level of socio-educational advantage. On average, these students come to school with a great level of advantage. A school with an index of 800 or below, however, works with students with considerable socio-educational disadvantage. It would be very unfair to compare the performances of such schools since the socio-educational backgrounds of their students are so different. But fair comparisons can be made among schools with students from similar levels of socio-educational advantage. Ixia was developed to enable such fair comparisons. Over time, we have improved our data collection. We have also improved the method for computing the index. We now have good measures for the index at the individual student level, so we can provide a stable estimate of a school's average index, as well as a good picture of the distribution of students' indices around their school's average. Having a strong and valid measure of socio-educational advantage enables us to identify schools with which fair comparison of students' literacy and numeracy levels can be made. These comparisons reveal marked differences in students' level of literacy and numeracy among schools working with students from similar levels of socio-educational advantage. The high performers in these comparisons show the others that they should raise their aspirations for their students. The comparisons invite all schools to work to weaken the influence of socio-educational background on students' educational achievements. We know from comparisons provided by the OECD's Program for International Student Assessment that in high-performing countries such as Canada, Finland, Japan and South Korea, differences in students' levels of socio-educational advantage are less strongly related to differences in their educational achievement than in Australia. Their educational systems are high quality and high equity. Ours are high quality but lower equity and we should be aspiring to match these countries. We hope you find the My School website to be valuable and easy to use. Please send us any feedback to info at akara.edu.au In this video, we will go over how to cite books in your reference list. Please note, all information mentioned is based on the 6th edition of the APA Style Guide. To begin, let's talk about what information you will need in order to cite a book in your reference list. You will need the author's full last name and first and middle initials, the year of publication, the full title of the book, including subtitles, edition if it is not in the first edition, the city of publication, and the name of the publisher. The author's last name and first initials are located at the beginning of the citation. The year of publication is located in brackets to the right of the author's name with a period on the outside of the brackets. The title of the book, including subtitles, is italicized and follows the year of publication. If the book is a second or higher edition, this needs to be included after the title or subtitle. It is written in brackets as the number of the edition, followed by E, D, period. A period follows the end bracket. The final piece of information is the location of publishing and the name of the publisher. When citing the city of publication, always list the city, followed by the state or province, using the postal abbreviation without periods. Here is an example of a real book that has been cited in an APA reference list. Not all books have main authors and instead might have editors. If the book you are citing has no author but instead is an edited volume, your reference entry will use the editor's names followed by bracket E D S period bracket period. The rest of the citation will look exactly the same as for an authored book.
A real example would look like this. If the book you are citing has an author and an editor, both need to be included in the reference section. Following the format for an authored book, the editor's name follows the book title. The editor is written as initials first, followed by the editor's last name, then ED period in brackets, followed by another period. This concludes the video tutorial on how to cite books in APA format in your reference list. Please check out our other video tutorials if you need more help. This screencast provides a quick tour of the database Medline. Medline is among the major databases for biomedical journal articles and also covers fields like nursing, dentistry, veterinary medicine, and others. Some people are more familiar with PubMed, which is the public interface for Medline and has almost identical content. For structured searching, Medline is the recommended option because of the control that you're able to exercise over your search. To access Medline, find the link located here in the Key Science and Health Science Databases column on the Gerstein Library homepage. Clicking on Medline will open the database where you might be prompted to enter your U2R ID and password. The default screen here is the Advanced Search page, which is where you should always begin your search. There's also a basic search option here, but since it does not include many of the helpful features and functions of the advanced search that make your searching more effective, we recommend avoiding it. From this screen, you can enter your search terms here in the search box, and you can also view your previous lines of search, also known as your search history, from the current session in a list at the top of the screen. After you enter your search and click search here, your results will populate below the light blue box here. You can also create an account to save your searches by clicking on My Account here at the top, and then clicking on Create an Account here on the right. You can then fill out the form and click on Create. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact us at ask.gerstein at utoronto.ca.